prestigious, the ones that get down to uh, the bottom line very quickly to discuss how the federal government can accelerate the development of vaccines and therapeutic treatments for the coronavirus. We want to welcome Dr. Deborah Burke. And Dr. Burks has been uh, to the White House a lot over her career, and she's now going to be here uh, working with Mike Pence and everybody uh, full time, and we appreciate it. We appreciate it very much, Dr. Burks, and uh, a real expert in her field. And if you'd like, you could ask her a couple of questions when we're finished. We work to, uh, we're working very hard to expedite the longer process of developing a vaccine. We're also moving with maximum speed to develop. Uh, therapies so that uh, we can help people recover as quickly as possible. We have a lot of recovery going on. We want to see if we can advance that. It's likely that therapies will be available before a vaccine is actually ready, and we'll seek to bring all effective treatments to market as soon as possible. Some very good work has been done on the vaccine, however, and they have some good progress, and you'll be able to ask a couple of questions of the folks here. We're also working with Congress to ensure that America has what it needs to respond to this challenge. It's a great challenge, but everybody's responding very well. Since the start of the outbreak, my administration has taken the most aggressive action in history to protect our citizens, including closing our borders very early, a lot earlier than people wanted us to do. And that turned out to be a good decision. I ordered sweeping travel restrictions, increased travel advisory levels, established screening measures, and imposed historic quarantines. Uh, we have quarantines all over the country, a lot of them. The coronavirus shows the importance of bringing manufacturing back to America so that we are producing at home the medicines and equipment and everything else that we need to protect the public's health. And I've been talking about this for a long time. That process has already started. It started long before we ever knew about this. Uh, we want to make certain things at home. We want to be doing our manufacturing at home. It's not only done in China. It's done in many other places, including Ireland. And a lot of places make our different uh, uh, drugs and things that we need so badly. And it's not good to be uh, dealing with one or two or three countries. And we do very little at home, and we're going to start doing it at home. And we've been talking about that for a long time. And a lot of the uh, drug companies, because of what we've done in terms of incentives and taxes, they're heading back here anyway. The coronavirus shows the importance of bringing all of that manufacturing back to America, and we will have that uh, started. It's already started, frankly. It started about a year ago. The White House Coronavirus Task Force, led by Vice President Mike Pence, has been meeting daily and coordinating closely with the state and local governments. Mike had a call today with 53 governors, and I heard it was uh, a very good call, and everybody is very well coordinated. And the governors and the states, all of them, I can't think of an exception. They've been really working closely with us, and it's been, it's been a very good, very good relationship. Uh, we will confront this challenge together, and we will continue to do exactly what we're doing. And uh, we're going to be very successful. Uh, a lot of things are happening. A lot of very exciting things are happening, and they're happening very rapidly. So with that, I'd like to introduce uh, Mike, and you can say a little bit as to your calls and some of the things that have happened today. Well, thank you, Mr. President. And uh, the uh, White House Corona Task Force uh, will be meeting again this afternoon. Uh, but as you mentioned earlier today, at your direction, we hosted a video and telephone conference call with 53 governors. Um, as the President said many times, we're all in this together. And today's meeting uh, is a reflection of the fact that this President understands that industry is a part of the one team in America that's going to address the coronavirus in this country. And I'm grateful for these leaders of the nation's top pharmaceutical companies to come in to speak to us about the development of vaccines, but also the development of therapeutic
and well-being of the American people first. Um, so, uh, with that, uh, Mr. President, I know mm -hmm. Secretary Azar has a few thoughts, and and uh, look forward to the meeting. And Alex, maybe you uh, can give a little update, and then we'll go around the room, and people can introduce themselves, if that's okay. Absolutely. Go ahead, Thank you, Mr. President, Mr. Vice President. Uh, so uh, we continue to see cases here in the United States. Uh, as you know, we tragically have experienced uh, several more deaths uh, reported today, uh, and our condolences go out to their families, of course. Um, that's why the President's leading this whole of government response at the direction of the Vice President. We're here working with the pharmaceutical company leaders on three key issues. How do we speed vaccines? How do we speed therapeutics? And what are the supply chain challenges that we may be facing? for pharmaceutical products here in the United States. Uh, with, regard to de with regard to therapeutics and vaccines, we want to know how we can not get in their way, but rather speed that development process along. And I want to make sure that they all know that we've got Commissioner Hahn here from the FDA, and this is all in the context of emergency powers, emergency use authorizations, and the President will be asking you, how can we make it faster? How can we make anything faster? How can we challenge some of those normal pharma timelines? That can be a little slow and bureaucratic. What can we do to speed that along given the nature of this emergency and be a good partner with you in making that happen, especially once we get the emergency supplemental passed by Congress in the next week or so? So with that said, Mr. President, thank you very much. And supplemental is uh, moving along very rapidly. Uh, everyone wants to get that done, moving along quickly. Uh, Emma, please. Uh, Emma Wormsley from GlaxoSmithKline. First of all, I'd like to um, really say how much we welcome the leadership, Mr. President, of this task force, NIH and BADA, and recognize the very substantial efforts that have already been made by the administration to protect people here in the US. Um, as a science-led company with a very large, including manufacturing presence here, we know we have a responsibility and a vital role to play. And our priority is to make sure we make available, as part of this one team, our pandemic adjuvant technology available to uh, any company uh, with a uh, high, highly promising vaccine because this new technology could make um, uh, these uh, other vaccines either bring more efficacy or indeed uh, uh, um, uh, allow them to be antigen sparing, which means we could protect more people, which is obviously incredibly important as we're trying to work uh, at pace and at, and at scale. We've already announced two collaborations and hope to uh, announce more, and we're also ready to produce, should the US government uh, require it, um, a stockpile of this um, uh, adjuvant. We know uh, fighting COVID-19 requires a global effort, uh, and uh, the U.S. is the vital leader in this. We're absolutely committed to play our part in the task force. Thank you, Emma. That's Beautiful. Good. Thank you Great. very much. Please. Oh, Anthony, go ahead. <laughs> I'd like you to say something anyway. <laughs> I'm Tony Fauci, the director of the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases. Very pleased to be on this task force, which I think you're going to see is working extraordinarily smoothly under the leadership of the Vice President and, and Secretary Azar. And as you know, we're involved, and that's the reason why I'm pleased to be with, in this room with you all, because we're involved in the fundamental basic and clinical research to develop countermeasures in the form of therapeutics and vaccines. And I'm sure I'll be working with many of you around the room, and I look forward to it. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Tony, very much. Bob? Thank you, Mr. President. Bob Redfield, the uh, Director of CDC. I uh, also want to Thank you all for being here. I want to extend that if there's anything CDC can also do as you begin to try to evaluate uh, some of your fruits of your labor, you know, we're here to uh, make that what we have available to help. We're all, we're all counting on a new countermeasures to be uh, in the arena pretty quickly. Thank you, Please. Good. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. Vice President, thanks for having me here. Good afternoon. I'm Dan Manicella, CEO of CureVac. Uh, we're a clinical stage biotech company. We use messenger RNA technology, um, optimized messenger RNA molecules. Once injected into the body, they instruct the cells on how to make proteins. For instance, we can use the mRNA technology to trigger an immune response against viruses, or we can get the body to increase its production of T cells for cancer vaccines. Um, in this way, CureVac can make potent prophylactic vaccines and cancer treatments. The technology also works well to replace missing proteins, so we can also work in the rare disease space. One strength of our technology is that we can produce prophylactic vaccines using a very low dose. So for instance, the phase one rabies trial that we just <coughs> completed, 
was done at a one microgram dose. So in other words, a millionth of a gram dose, a very, very tiny dose. Um, and so more broadly, our company focuses, so this year we have four programs in phase one clinical trials, and the coronavirus program will be the fifth program in phase one. We expect that the phase one program for coronavirus will start beginning of June. Our technology platform is fast and it's agile. We were the first messenger RNA company to have GMP manufacturing. We started in 2006. Currently, we have three large-scale GMP facilities, um, and we are up and, running, or up and running now. Today, we have a fourth facility built, and we're looking for additional CapEx to put the machinery in there. Once we have that machinery in the fourth building, we can make hundreds of millions of doses of the coronavirus vaccine. So we're very excited about that, and we want to help there. Um, Additionally, we have developed a fully automated production of machine. This automated machine is part of uh, the collaboration with CEPI. And additionally, with CEPI, we are working on the coronavirus. They have funded our efforts to get the program and the vaccine into phase one uh, by June. The key point here being that we believe we can develop the vaccine for COVID-19 very, very quickly. And we have the wherewithal to manufacture it, although we would like some additional help on our largest GMP4 facility. Um, again, we appreciate the opportunity to be here today. and. Uh, thank you very thank much. You. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Um, John, go ahead, please. Sure. <clears throat> I'm John Shiver, I head vaccine research for and developer for Cetapy Vaccine. cetapy has been making vaccines for over 100 years. And we're for this project, we're working with proprietary uh, recombinant protein technology that makes the first flu vaccine that's not an X, that's based on this technology. Um, it has the potential to be applied very readily to coronavirus. Some early work done with SARS, the related virus, was very promising. We intend to leverage that work so that we can get to the clinic as soon as possible. Uh, because we are a major you know, uh, flu vaccine producer with this technology, we have the ability to produce uh, uh, large amounts of vaccine. We predict, depending upon the final formulation, 100 to 600 million doses per year made in New York and Pennsylvania which is where we make most of our, about 90% of our flu product. And we can do this without jeopardizing our flu vaccine production, importantly, because we know that's very important to maintain that. So Mr. President, we're willing to do whatever it takes to work with you and this administration. The collaboration we've had said, with NIH and with BARDA, who's co-sponsoring our research, to make sure that we do what we can to help with this problem. When do you think you could have the vaccine? When do you think you'd be able to have it, start producing it? We're producing it now an experimental lot. Uh, proteins take somewhat longer than some of the other technologies more exploratory, but it's a, pro it's a technology that works. We think we can be ready for the clinic in a year. And depending upon the nature of how the epidemic goes or doesn't go, uh, you know, uh, we would, and with the help of the agencies of this country, uh, you know, perhaps as few as several years, difficult to predict, Mr. President, knowing that a vaccine has to be both safe and efficacious because it's given to healthy people. Thank you very much. Lenny? Thanks, Mr. President, for having us. Uh, I'm Len Schleifer, the founder and CEO of the General Owner Company uh, that I built with George Acopolis over the last uh, 30 years. Um, and we are a uh, monoclonal antibody primarily centered uh, company. We are no strangers to collaborating with the administration. We work with uh, Secretary Azar's group, Barter, and we came up with a cure for Ebola. Um, and we're very proud of that. Uh, Dr. Fauci's group was really instrumental in testing that under unbelievable conditions in the Congo. Um, and it didn't create quite as much excitement because, thank goodness, it didn't hit our shores. But we can use the exact same technology, and we already have. We have a 1,000 antibodies uh, that are already sitting in dishes. We're screening them. We're selecting them. We anticipate if all goes well, 200,000 doses per month can come out of our factory in New York uh, starting in August. Uh, the unique thing about our technology... That means you'd be able to use the vaccine that early? Depends on what uh, we see, uh, how we work closely with the FDA, uh, which we'll, we will do. The FDA has already reached out to us, but we've got to work closely. So that process would be faster than John's? It would be. Um, the Can you explain why that would be? Well, so we make um, passive uh, vac uh, vaccine and therapeutic, therapeutic. Our drug will be able to protect you whether or not you're infected, it'll protect you from getting infected, or if you are infected, it would treat you. And the, we have just taken processes that normally take years, 
literally years, and we put them end to end and now do them in weeks to months that nobody else in the industry can do. So we're very excited to collaborate once again. So this will be a combination of a vaccine and also it will put it in a different way, make you better quicker. Yeah, well think of it this way. If you if you get immunized with one of these vaccines, you're gonna make some antibodies to protect you. We're gonna already make those antibodies and give them to you so you don't have to go through that whole process. So it'll protect you. And as we showed with Ebola, you give enough of them, we, it was life-saving, life, uh, truly life-saving. It beat out the antivirals. It really it, it was the way to go. It's very predictable. I just want to say I hope everybody succeeds here. I mean, this is yeah. bringing everybody together here is really <coughs> critical. And there's going to be success. This industry is really talented uh, as an industry. Sometimes we run astray, but we're going to get this done. Thank you very much. Thanks. I appreciate it. Please. Thank you, Mr. President, for the invitation. Stéphane Dorcel, I'm the CEO of Moderna. So the Moderna team in Massachusetts is very proud uh, to be uh, working with the U.S. government and to have already sent in only 42 days from the sequence of the virus uh, or vaccine to uh, Dr. Fauci's team at the NIH. Uh, we're now waiting for the vaccine to be green light from the FDA so that the team can start dosing uh, as soon as possible. What is very interesting about our technology is that we use messenger RNA. So basically, it's an information molecule that allows to go very quickly from the genetic information of a virus to having a vaccine. So we have already have nine vaccines in the clinic uh, in the US, in Germany, and in Australia. We have five of those for uh, respiratory diseases. We've already partnered with DARPA uh, from Department of Defense, with BARDA from HHS. We're having ongoing discussions. We were able to go so fast because we are working for many years with the NIH and we had worked with uh, Dr. Sparsi's team on the MERS uh, vaccine for the Middle East Respiratory <coughs> Syndrome, which is a coronavirus. Yeah. And so we were able to move very, very fast uh, from a few phone calls to getting a vaccine made uh, ready for the clinic. We are now working on the phase two material. So that as soon as we get the phase one dose out of the NIH, we'll be able to start the phase two right away. What is your timing then? What would you say? So we're hoping to get the the phase one starts very soon now. We're just waiting for a green light. The product is at the NIH. And then there's going to be a few months to get the human data that will allow us to pick a therapeutic dose to start the phase two right away. So you're talking over the next few months, you think you would have a vaccine? Correct. No. Uh, with phase two. Yeah. You wouldn't have a vaccine. You'll have a vaccine to go into the test. Phase two, yeah. yes. <laughs> and how long would that take? The phase two will take a few months before we can go into phase three. Right, so you're talking within a, a year. Like I've been telling you, yeah. Yes. Yes. A, a year to a year. Plenty is talking about two months. Right? <laughs> <laughs> and, we would be there, and we would be there in June. We, would, we will be there in June. In a couple of months. Right? I mean, I like the sound of a couple of months better. Must be honest. <laughs> when, but when you say June phase one initiation, though, right? In June, yeah. not a completed vaccine. Yeah. 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 Well, it would well, be a vaccine that would be ready for testing in phase one. But, but not ready, ready to use, use you're talking about a completed. <coughs> ready to use when, would you say? Ready to use. It's on the public. I think it depends. next season. So assuming that the vaccine is well tolerated, it's safe and efficacious, as John said, um, then I think the question is how do we work with the FDA to expedite that as fast as possible through some sort of fast track program to get it through phase two and three testing to get to, so to quickly. Right. So as quickly as possible. Right? What do you say to that, Lenny? Look, I, I, I sense the cautiousness of uh, Dr. Fauci and he's right to be cautious because vaccines have to be tested because there's precedent for vaccines to actually make diseases worse. And you really don't want to make it, you don't want to rush and treat a million people and find out you're making 900,000 of them worse. It's a good idea. So, yeah. So, that's why I think why Dr. Fauci is being a little bit cautious. I don't want to speak for him, but so we need to prove that. You know, I think that with our technology, by knowing that we have neutralizing antibodies that we give, we know that this approach worked for Ebola, we know that it worked for MERS and animals, we have a greater degree of confidence. Um, that this would work uh, sooner, I think. But right. okay, That's just the way it is. Thank you very much, Daniel. Yeah, Mr. President, Great Mr. Vice President, thank you for having us here. So I'm going to switch it up a little bit. We're right. not a vaccine company. We're a therapeutic company Good. focused on antivirals. Let's, let's talk about and, that. And uh, Gilead Sciences, I know, has worked with a lot of people around the table here. Let me first take the opportunity to thank you for the efforts of the administration, the secretary on the uh, HIV elimination program, which right. we're 
closely connected. Incredible. With, uh, with I mean, the, with HIV, incredible. To be able to prevent and treat this disease is just extraordinary. So we're so saying 10 years, but now we're into nine years because it could have been started earlier and somebody else didn't start it earlier, but we started it right away. Uh, and I'm now saying, I started off saying 10 years, now I'm down to nine years. Do you think by the end of nine years, uh, HIV is where? I hope we can eliminate it in the developed I mean, can world. Can you I mean, imagine we'll be eliminated in Because country. we have the ability to prevent it now. And That's if you such can a get to thing. the people to really prevent it and treat everybody, I think it's, a, it's if you remember certainly something back, we're fully committed to. If you remember back 10 years ago, how horrible that was, and a little beyond the 10 years, and now to, to, Commissioner to think about, about what you've done, what, what's happened. So, yeah, Daniel, absolutely. let's so talk about So we're using this. that same antiviral experience that Gilead has had decades to now to apply it to coronavirus. So we have a medicine called remdesivir which is like a decade-long development that's, a, that's an antiviral used to treat uh, coronaviruses, the same viruses that, uh, the same family as SARS and MERS, and we're hoping it has effects now against uh, COVID-19. So we know in vitro that it has very high effect. So you have a medicine that's already involved with the coronaviruses, yes. and now you have to see if it's specifically for this. When uh, you, Correct. you can know that tomorrow. So tomorrow. well, we have we now now the critical thing is to do clinical trials, and oh, we're well, in the uh, we're in the process. We have two clinical trials going on in China that were started uh, several weeks ago. There are uh, 400 patient trials each. Uh, they're getting close to halfway enrolled. Or any response yet? Well, we don't know because they're double blind randomized trials. So we have to wait till the conclusion of the trial. We expect to get that information in April. Then we've been working with uh, Tony and the group at NIH to have another protocol, uh, an NAID, that will also be a <coughs> protocol that we'll use in China, outside of China, here in the United States, to, to test for the virus. And we have two other uh, clinical trials that we're going to initiate next week. Anything Gilead. here? Anything? Uh, yes, yes. Well, the NIAID trial already had its first patients in Nebraska. Uh, and I think, Tony, we're working on getting Washington to Washington State now. Would you go to Washington State, where it seems to have Absolutely. problems? Absolutely. So the intention is to, to begin I think it's a great patients idea. there in the coming days. Yeah. Right? Because the trial is really ready to go. So we're, we're fully Would dedicated. you go to specifically the nursing home where they had an yes. outbreak? Yes, and the community, of course, that that touches, because all sure. the healthcare workers and that, the family members that have When you, when will that take place? So when literally, I think, Tony, I think it's the next couple of days. Couple couple of days. If yeah. Tony's involved, it'll be tomorrow morning. Yeah, that's it. That's right, Tony. But this is a collaboration. You know, we worked on the protocol together. Obviously, we're providing the investigational medicine. We're working hand in glove with many people around the table to make sure that whether it's FDA or CDC or So when will NIH. you know if it works? I mean, you already have this medicine. Well, when I you think know we'll know in the April time frame. And, uh, That's good. Yep. Dan, Dan and, do you and know, do you all, if you're able to say, do you have any negative kickouts, kickouts like futility analyses or DSMB reviews? There is a DSMB that? review, and the, in the trial in China, they would probably take a look at some of that data in March. Okay. So far, there's, that would be only stopped, though, for yeah. safety reasons. Okay. Okay. You really have to wait till the end of the trial okay. to see how so we're moving as fast as we can. I think everybody around the table is moving as fast as we can. And, and on top of that, of course, we have to anticipate success. So we're significantly investing in the manufacturing facility and capacity. We've been working closely with the administration. To make You've sure already built the facility the to manufacture. We have, we have facilities that we're repurposing for the coronavirus. This would be tremendous news system. if that works. Yes, yeah, because be you're there. Terrific. I mean, you're there. You have the plant. You have everything ready. We have a trial in severe patients and in more moderate patients. We're trying to understand, as we all are with the epidemiology of this disease, wh wh where and when is the best place to treat. That's very so exciting. Get it done, exciting. Daniel. We're on it. Don't disappoint us, Daniel. You right. understand that? Uh, great company. Really great Thank company. You. Thank you. Support. Doctor, perhaps you'd like to say a few words? Good. Thank Please. you, Mr. President, Mr. Vice President. Um, it's really an honor to be here with you. I'm really uh, interested in hearing uh, the efforts that are ongoing. You know that we're working with you very closely now with many of you, and uh, it's been a great relationship. Well, we're very interested, this is the message I want to send, we're very interested in facilitating the development of therapeutics, diagnostics, vaccines, uh, for the benefit of the American people. And um, we, of course, want them to be safe and efficacious, but really look forward to, to working with you on this. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Right. You're going to do a fantastic job. Thank you, Doug. Please. Um, Mr. President, Mr. Vice President, um, I'm Chief Sci Scientist for Pfizer. Yeah. Um, we are very pleased to be here. And for us, it's been always important when there are major public health threats to come together 
across the industry with biotechs and federal agencies. So we were highly appreciative of the initiative that you've taken in this powerful way to have all of us around this table. Um, Pfizer, as you know, is a proud American company. We have 170 years of experience, originally founded in Brooklyn and headquartered in New York, and we have brought many vaccines, therapeutics of small or large types for patients suffering from many different diseases, including infectious diseases. Now, specifically for the COVID-19, the coronavirus, we have identified compounds, uh, medicines that we have uh, that we think due to their activity against very related um, viruses have good high probability to be active against COVID-19. And in March, we are confirming that um, assumption with laboratories that have access to do this uh, hazardous work of um, using uh, the live virus to confirm activity. That would allow us to work closely with uh, Dr. Hahn here at the FDA and, and they identify the fastest path to bring it to patients uh, that should happen if things go well this year. And as soon as possible, I can hear your uh, encouragement to all of us. Um, I, I wanted also to say that uh, Pfizer has uh, 30, 3 zero R&D and manufacturing sites in the US, more than 30,000 Americans involved in making or discovering medicines and we're willing to share our experience, our capabilities as a team here to make sure that the public in America gets the best solutions. So do you expect to be dealing with each other a little bit, your competitors, yeah. but in this case it's different. Uh, this is something we want to get done very quickly. Do you expect to be sharing your own capabilities with Pfizer and everybody else? Absolutely. Good. I, I think the call to action that has come from you makes all of us feel that we should be one team here. I agree. Uh, we would appreciate that. And as a closing remark, we've had a tremendous partnership with NIH and the NIAD in many areas being pioneering to bring medicine or advances forward with CDC dialogues and with FDA here. So for us to, we look forward to extend this relationship to make sure that uh, Americans can as fast as possible, given your um, encouragement to us, and with um, have different options to protect them. Protection is by vaccines. To uh, deal with those that are exposed, we need treatments, and those that are ill, we need treatment. So it's not just one solution. I think from this team, we should offer uh, multiple approaches, therapeutic and vaccines. Do you see patients. that happening? Because I notice you have a few different variants of what we're talking about. Do you see that happening where Maybe there are different, either therapeutics or vaccines, or both, uh, where you use combinations of each, I, I maybe in different areas? You are right on the frontier of science. <laughs> uh, it is about combination. And even looking at our colleagues uh, here at Gilead, we have learned that if you have two different mechanisms and put them together as treatment, the likelihood of curing or very long-lasting responses is higher. And we actually work on complementary mechanisms. I think it's fantastic. It's been, it's been the story of HIV. I love, uh, yeah, uh, I love the complementary. If you can do that, I love the complementary. Because of our commitment, yeah. Yeah, that's fantastic. Thank you very much. That's really very exciting. Please. Mr. Thank President. Thank you very much. Mr. Vice President. Uh, my name is Joseph Kim. I run a company called Innovio Pharmaceuticals out of Pennsylvania. We're a proud American biotech company with uh, R&D and manufacturing in California as well. Uh, Innovio is the leader in coronavirus vaccine development in the world. Uh, we have a phase two product uh, for a related MERS uh, coronavirus vaccine uh, in phase two stage. Uh, when the new outbreak occurred, we applied our very innovative 21st century uh, platform called DNA Medicines platform to COVID-19 uh, by getting the just the DNA sequence of the virus, we're able to fully construct our vaccine within three hours. And we've been working on preclinical uh, and, and uh, preparation work uh, with the help of the FDA and acceleration and, and really working very well together. Uh, our plan is to start the US-based clinical trials for COVID-19 vaccine in April of this year, followed by shortly thereafter uh, a, a trial in China 
In South Korea, there are a lot more infections in those areas. Um, we can give you an area, too. <laughs> yeah, we can. I mean, you take, so, you take a look at Seattle again. We can give you an area. So, absolutely. You don't mind. Uh, yeah. We've been collaborating with uh, uh, U.S. agencies like DARPA, NIH. We collaborated with Dr. Birx uh, in HIV vaccines and many, many years ago. Um, uh, with existing uh, resources and capacity, by end of this year, uh, Inovio could deliver about one million doses, but to scale by, uh, by end of this year, but to scale beyond that, we need your help, Mr. President. We need to work with you and your agencies, BARDA and others, uh, to help us scale our vaccine, uh, to manufacture in America, to protect American public, uh, also to lead the world in vaccine development from America. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much. You'll have our help. Thank you. Please, Doug. Mr. President, Mr. Vice President, um, I'm Dostal Holzheim, Vice Chairman and Chief Scientific Officer, Officer for Johnson & Johnson. Yes. I'm in the in drug and vaccine research since 30 years, did several drugs for HIV. At the moment, working with a vaccine platform, which has been deployed or is being deployed in HIV, we did uh, in the times of Zika, as well as now in Ebola. We are working with Tony on a phase two and phase three study with the HIV, with the same platform. Um, with BARDA, we have extensively collaborated on, uh, on an Ebola vaccine. At the moment, we are vaccinating 1,000 people a day in Rwanda and in DRC showing the safety of, uh, of the uh, and the same vaccine platform we are now deploying for for corona um, in, since the availability of the information on the virus mid-January we have been uh, working day and night on getting to a vaccine the first versions of that are being tested in animals at the moment with positive results and in parallel the company has decided to start upscaling now um, time to result uh, will depend on on, uh, on GMP manufacturing, safety, preclinical safety. You have to work closely together with the FDA on that uh, before the year end. Uh, hopefully in November we have the first clinical data starting and early next year the results of that. And at the same time we're looking for significant quantity of vaccines being, uh, being already produced uh, in that time frame. Uh, but you can't do anything else than at the moment starting parallel um, the biological clinical work in parallel doing the upscaling uh, and let's see where, where we end as fast as possible. So do you have different concepts and methods then? You, you know, Pfizer and Johnson & Johnson, all the great yeah. companies. Are, are you having different, some seem to be faster than others and others, they, they do seem to be different uh, concepts. The difference in the concept is that we are using a cold virus, an adeno vector, which, which there is a place where you can place a piece of corona, Ebola or HIV. So we trick the body with another virus and generate the, and generate the antibodies. And that's like different that. from the others? It's different from the others. The difference is also, it's been used for many years now. It has been proven for many years that you can do it like that. And we also have a validated upscaling platform which can produce millions of doses in a very short time frame. And that's a parallel process where we develop the cell line, which if we follow uh, what we could do with Ebola, we could produce like uh, up to hundreds of millions of vaccines in a, in a small, let's say re reasonably small facility for manufacturing. So can you have it ready for next season, any of you? I mean, would you say for that's next cool. season? The next season that should would be, be the ready. Goal. Yeah. But uh, like many people it said, it seems to be very seasonal, right? We have to be we have to be very careful here. If you vaccinate several hundred million, you got to make sure it works. Works and, and safe. doesn't doesn't hurt. Yeah, that's right. That's I agree. Great. I agree. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Great company. Thank you. Doctor Would you like to say something? Oh, just um, Ann shook it from the CDC, and really appreciate the chance to hear it. Thank you. Yes. Mr. President, Mr. Vice President, thank you for saving the most exciting company for the last. <laughs> <laughs> so we're Novavax. We're down the street in Maryland. We're a yeah. vaccine company. We make recombinant nanoparticles. We make respiratory vaccines. We have two in phase three trials. We have uh, an RSV vaccine where we vaccinated 4,600 4, pregnant women to protect the infants from RSV disease and, and uh, the youngest uh, kids. We have our uh, flu vaccine. We all know we need a better flu vaccine, and we have one in phase three trials. We're going to unblind in four weeks. Exciting time for the company. 
But we actually uh, are a company that's focused on emerging infectious diseases. We've made two coronavirus vaccines. We made one for SARS. We made one for MERS. We tested MERS and all the way through animal challenge trials and showed 100% uh, protection. We have an Ebola vaccine that, that uh, with the NIH showed in four different non-human primate studies that we had 100% protection at, at extremely low doses. And uh, we've made a pandemic flu vaccine for H7 and 9 and others. And, and we've twice now taken from the gene sequence to the first in human studies, done them in 90 days, and published it in the New England Journal. And we're once again doing the same thing since the gene sequence was, was uh, uh, identified, I think, published on January 10th. We've taken our same recombinant nanoparticle platform and uh, have been in animal studies for a couple of weeks. We expect data this week on from one of them. On corona. And on this, I'm sorry, on corona, yes. And, and uh, we're going into non-human primates this week with the coronavirus uh, vaccine candidate. So, so what do you think in terms of timing? What do you think? Timing is, is what you hear around the table, is, is we can get into humans in the uh, May-June timetable and uh, in a phase one study. And, and, also, but we'll have primate data. So those are unheard of speeds, I think, right? Pretty much. We'll, we'll make it very easy for you, but those are, and we have to be very safe, but those are unheard of speeds. Go ahead, please. No, and, and, and we're trying to identify um, uh, scale so that we can get to the billion, billion unit scale, both where we have a vaccine antigen and we also have an adjuvant, and we put those together and you get, you get the most promising. Uh, result, I think, and so we, we, we desperately need and have uh, good relationships with the FDA and, and to work with the FDA to, to see where instead of waiting 30 days for to get to an IND, you get it in 10 days or 20, whatever the number is, but, but there are a lot of things that we can do with the FDA, and, and frankly, we need money. We're a biotech company. I'm not one of the larger pharma companies, and, and uh, so we need, we need we money to get with scale. the other companies also. And, and we have worked with the other companies, and, and on this particular uh, instance, we have not yet, but, but okay. can. So. Dr. Stephen Hahn, by the way, is the new head of the FDA, for those of you that don't know, and he's uh, one of the most respected people in the country, and this is the man we wanted, and this is the man we got. You didn't know you were going to be hit with this your first month. Right? <laughs> yes, sir. Been here for a couple of months, and uh, this was uh, pretty big. Uh, Deborah, would you like to say something? Well, thank you. It's a privilege to be here. Thank you, Mr. President, Mr. Vice President. I think what was exciting to hear around the table is you have a potential for a bridge, a bridge between the therapeutics and monoclonals while we work on the vaccines. And I think that's the most promising piece for the American people, to know that there's technology that can be used as an immediate bridge, and then as we work on the vaccines. I think making sure that we've tested all of the antivirals that you have in your collection against this particular virus, do IC50s across the board. Many of you have um, antiviral medication, and I think just to assure the American people that we have tried using our innovators to actually screen all the current drugs for potential activity against this virus would be key. But I think this is very promising with this linkage that you put together in this room between monoclonal antibodies, therapeutics, and vaccines. Mm -hmm. It's very encouraging. It is very exciting, and the speed is very exciting, too. Anybody else have anything to say? Anybody? At I all? also have something on the screening. So we set up already a, a, an industry consortium where everyone is now able to submit, biotech or pharmaceuticals, to submit to a screening uh, which is set up for everybody, supported by BARDA and supported by, uh, by Europe. Yeah, yeah. You'll move rapidly. Uh, media, would you like to ask any questions of any of the Mr. geniuses President, around President, the table? What economic stimulus measures are you considering to boost the economy as a result of the virus? Well, I guess the market's up today. Our country is very strong economically, as you know. Uh, this was a uh, something that came out of China that was a big surprise to the world. It happened just a few weeks ago, and uh, uh, I, I'm sure the Fed is looking at it. I hope the Fed is looking at it. They should be, but a lot of the central banks are looking at it for stimulus. And one thing I want to add, uh, we keep talking about for America, but really we're looking at it for a cure for the whole world, because this is a world cure, not just yeah. United States. We want to take care of the United States, but uh, whatever we do is going to inure to the benefit of the world, so we want to do that. And uh, fortunately, your, some of your companies are so large, you can, you can handle that, but you work together 
thereby making it even better. So we appreciate that. We would love to have you work together on this, get it done, and get it done safely and quickly. Uh, but I think uh, I know we're in very strong shape, very strong shape financially. And, and, you know, I have to tell you, I came into the room not expecting to hear quite what I've heard. Uh, but a lot of work has already been done. We've been encouraging them for the last few weeks. I mean, literally from the first day when we shut it down, when we shut down the border, so to speak, uh, we shut it down to China. We didn't like to do, but we made a good decision. Uh, but we also called some of the companies around the table, said, get going, just in case, get going. And uh, we're very proud of the work that some of them have done. Some are very advanced already on this particular coronavirus. So we appreciate it. That's tremendous news. And I think the speed is a lot greater than a lot of people would have thought. Yeah. And do you see a need for federal dollars to go to some of these drug companies? I think two of the CEOs around the well, table no, mentioned I, I think they're so rich. Money. I know the companies very well. Some of them are so rich, I think uh, yeah. they can right. actually loan money to the federal government. <laughs> they, don't, they don't need money. They need time. I think what they need more than anything else, Daniel, you might tell me, but I think what you need is uh, FDA and uh, Tony have to help you get through the process uh, as quickly as possible. Uh, the bureaucratic stuff, and, and we don't have bureaucrats here. We have people that really know how to get it done, between Tony and Bob and uh, Stephen. Uh, they'll get you folks through very, very quickly. Speaking of the Fed, Mr. President, uh, do you think that they should hold an emergency meeting before the meeting in a couple of weeks to cut rates and has your, is your administration? Well, I think they should have had a meeting already. So, you know, I think they should have, and the central banks are going to be talking about various things tomorrow, uh, but we'll see what happens. But I think they should have had a meeting already. I don't know what takes them so long. Will you ask them to? Will you ask them to? Uh, I'll see what happens. Let's see what happens tomorrow. What do you say to Americans who are you know, buying out all the hand sanitizers? CBS. They're buying what? Buying out all the hand sanitizers. CBS. We're stockpiling groceries for basements. We're concerned about a long-term uh, what would you say? Listen, as the President has said and we've said uh, from the outset, we're going to see more cases here in the United States, and we need to be prepared. We need to be pre we prepare for the worst case. We hope for the best case. Part of preparing is normal preparedness activities by individuals. Go to cdc.gov to get information about just sound preparedness at home, like you would have for a hurricane or for the flu season. That's the same type of activity now. So having some food having some hand sanitizer, but frankly, soap and water, a good, a good soap and water hand washing um, for an appropriate amount of time, if you look at cdc.gov for guidance, is as effective as that kind of sanitizer. But people should not be panicked. They shouldn't be. I, I know they may feel that. They may feel a sense of unease. They feel the uncertainty. And we're trying to reveal all information we have. Um, but there are steps people could take like that, which is good, Everyday preparedness. Nothing different today than they I would have advised six months ago to people. Are you considering tightening any of the travel regulations that you set? Yes, we are uh, to certain countries where they have more of a breakout. We are. Uh, you know what those countries are. I don't have to say, but uh, we are doing that, and we've already done it, as you know, with three countries, in addition to China. So uh, we will be doing that. Yes. You said South here. What's the I don't think you'll need that because I really think we're in, you know, extremely good shape. Uh, we're prepared for anything, and we could always do that at a later date if we need it, but I don't think we need that at this stage. You know, interestingly, we were discussing, and a question I get asked a lot by people is, uh, on average, you lose from 26,000 to 70,000 or so, and even in some cases more from the flu. We, lose, we have deaths of that per year. Uh, worldwide, it's hundreds of thousands of deaths from the common flu. And they ask, you know, what's the difference and how does this uh, differ? And I guess there are things that are similar and things that are different. Every one of them is different. Uh, it might not be a bad question to ask because I get that all the time. Uh, so, so far, we have six here. You have, in other countries, very — I mean, China obviously got hit the hardest. Uh, I noticed that South Korea is hit very hard. Italy is being hit very hard. Uh, but I, I would like to maybe know, because I, I am oftentimes asked, we average, I suspect, uh, Tony, I think you said from around 26, 27,000 to up to 60 or 70,000 right. deaths per year. That's a lot of deaths. And uh, 
here we're talking about a much smaller range. Now, hopefully, it stays at a much smaller range. And again, we're prepared for anything. Uh, could I ask you, uh, or any of you, if you'd like to answer that question, where would the public, what would the public think when you have so many? And that's taken routinely. And I was shocked to hear this. You know, three, four weeks ago, I said, well, how many people die a year from the flu? And in this country, I think last year was 36 or 37,000 people. And I'm saying, wow, nobody knew that information. Worldwide, you just multiply it out times the world, right? Uh, so what is the difference, Daniel? Well, I think there are people around the table that probably are more medically qualified. But I mean, uh, clearly, what we represent around the table is the ability to prevent, uh, you know, a, 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 you know, an endemic of sorts yeah. and the ability to treat. And those two things going together, I think, are really, really important as the best experience presented. So we may have to up our research on the flu. Well, yeah, right. On and the common flu. We for the flu, and we have vaccinations for right. the flu, <laughs> and, and we need to continue to improve upon it. Good. Those. Uh, Doctor? Yeah, we, we actually have taken on the challenge that you uh, just mentioned. So we are investing in what could be new technology to completely change the outcome of flu. And you need to think about how you can move fast from the first cases to have the right type of vaccine and how you can be able to manufacture it very fast. Because I, I think you are right on to point that the numbers in flu are so large and we haven't come that to that level yet. But I think it's also the fear that there is no experience yet with this virus. And we don't have uh, the feeling of going to CVS and get the flu vaccine or use some of the early developed drugs. But I, I think you summarized it very well. These are challenges we should take on year by year in advance uh, and protect lives. President, including, including uh, Tony, that you have to maybe we have to step up our work on the flu because when you lose that well, many people, yeah, it's, that's up. Mr. President, what we're doing is that we have a major effort to develop what we call yeah. the universal flu vaccine, right? Namely, a vaccine that you can give that will cover all the different strains, so you don't have to keep worrying about it mutating from year to year. That's fantastic. Yeah, so that's a major effort that we're having. Because I notice every year they say a different vaccine, they have a little different, a little. And, right. and then, you know, I hear numbers that are not great, 60 percent, 70 percent coverage, success. And yet I hear numbers that are better than that with respect to corona. You think you can really knock it out. And that's because you know specifically what it is, I suspect. So that's impressive. What do you think, Lenny? I think one thing we can be sure, we're going to be surprised. <laughs> about what happens over the next couple of months. And we've got to be prepared, as you're trying to do, for every surprise that'll come at us. Because remember, maybe 100 million people, I was just checking, get vaccinated for the flu, even if there's 60 percent protection. We have nobody in this country vaccinated for coronavirus right now. So that, if it goes through the well, public... The same vaccine could not work. You take a, a solid flu vaccine, you don't think that would have an impact or much of an impact on corona? No. no. Probably none. Uh, probably not. So that's why you have a difference when you have a, a, a population that is totally naked to this virus. Yeah. We, that's why a vaccine approach, getting that as quickly as we can, of course, is, is paramount. And the other thing is we, we have a group of people around this table, myself included, who are, in who are in an industry where optimism is an essential part of the toolkit. But realism is that, you know, 95 percent of what we all work on doesn't go too far. So we, that's why it's so important to have so many different approaches. We can't pick it the It seems to me, way. just based on what you said and also what the other folks said from great companies, companies I know very well from just seeing, you know, what they do, and I find it very interesting. I have for a long time. It would seem to me that uh, you already know pretty much where you're going and where you're headed and what the answer is going to be. It would seem that, Steve. Doesn't it seem? You seem to know what the answer is to this. You have to get it done. Or is that too optimistic a statement? I think some of the new technologies that have come, uh, we heard today a little bit about uh, mRNA and DNA, where you use completely new right. tools and technologies. They give us an opportunity to move fast. And that's why some of the companies that have been working on other diseases can quickly sh uh, change priorities and meet a huge public health threat. But uh, I think we should take on as a team to do something with the uh, seasonal flu and actually I think, Robert Redfield, that has been one of your key priorities, and we have certainly picked up on that. By the way, that would be a great thing if you could do that. Just aside from this meeting, if you could do that, that would be a great thing. 
Does anybody else have anything to say, please? Well, I want to just thank you all very much for being here. And it sounds — I'm very — it's a very optimistic meeting. I didn't realize you were that far advanced. And you'll get together if you have to. You'll deal with Tony and Bob, and you'll deal with uh, Stephen. And uh, get it done. We need it. We want it fast. Okay? Mr. Thank you. Do you accept that this will take longer, probably, than you would like? I don't know what the time will be. I don't think they know what the time will be. I've heard very quick numbers, a matter of months, and I've heard pretty much a year would be an outside number. So I think that's not a bad — that's not a bad range. But if you're talking about three to four months in a couple of cases and a year in other cases, uh, wouldn't you say, Doctor, would that be about right? Is it realistic to think, really, that a vaccine could be ready? If well, you have the greatest companies in the world sitting around the table. I mean, Johnson & Johnson and Pfizer and all of the companies, Gilead, uh, you have all of these great companies, and that's what they're saying. So I think that uh, would I think you, would you make sure you get the president the information that a vaccine that you make and start testing in a year is not a vaccine that's deployable. So he's asking the question, when is it going to be deployable? And that is going to be at the earliest a year to a year and a half, no matter how fast you go. I you think that's right. As you said, because the treatment is so going to be available before the vaccine. Before before vaccine. vaccine. That's that's what well, I, I think treatment, in many ways, might be more exciting. Yeah. No, okay. Yeah. That's, and that's what I think, and that's what I think Ambassador, Ambassador, Ambassador Burks, I think, laid out a really nice framework as we think about managing expectations, which is be thinking antiviral therapeutics, transitioning to monoclonal antibodies, and eventually to vaccines as we think about the continuum of research and development here. Is that fair for our CEOs? Yeah, that's yeah. That's quite, well, you know, I think, Tony, I think that's interesting because the concept of treatment in a certain way, especially when you have people that are, you know, looking for treatment, they've already got, they're beyond the vaccine stage. That would be very exciting. And it always goes faster than vaccine because yeah. you're dealing with someone yeah. who's already sick. Yeah. So great. the safety issues are going to be yeah. much, much different. Yeah. Yeah. And you will know your result almost immediately, whereas with vaccines, it takes so, a little So time. then what would be your timing for treatment? Therapeutics, commonly known as, but I call it dance, dance probably What would be your right number for, for us? We can think about producing 20,000 doses by the end of the summer of a tr course of treatment. Um, and as uh, Dr. Fauci said, you're going to find out very quickly. It's not going to be a mystery whether these things work or not. We're pretty confident that a mono our, ours is the monoclonal antibody approach. We think that that approach has a very high probability in the near term of delivery. Uh, so so, yeah, that, I think so treatment, I mean, just for the media, so the treatment element of it goes faster than the vaccine element of it, which, in my opinion, in this case, would be better. Go ahead, please. Mr. But, I mean, the remdesivir, our medicine, is in phase three trials right now. And these trials are conducted very fast. I mean, we're talking about 30-day endpoints. Yeah, so. so you recruit them. You know in 30 days, you know, once you recruit whether it works or not. Thankfully, so far, the drug seems to be very safe. What we have to determine is this level of, of efficacy, its clinical effectiveness. Uh, and that, as I said, we'll know so potentially as So it could be used as a treatment. Somebody is sick, right. they have the problem. Tony, it yes. could be used. When do you think it could be used? Well, if the, if the trial that, that Daniel was talking about proves efficacy, which you likely might know in a few months whether it's e e yes. effective or not, yes. if you know by June yes. that it's effective, then you just scale up and manufacture it, and you're good to go. How good is that? We're, we're scaling is that, Jeff? <laughs> That's good even by your standpoint, well, let me, Jeff. Let me give you an example, for instance, with, with the Regeneron product with Ebola. So Tony Fauci and his team uh, and the World Health Organization ran a historic forearm clinical trial in the war zone in eastern Congo. And two of the products, one of them developed by NIAID, and the one other of them one developed, developed by, by Regeneron, right. Proved so effective that the ethical board said stop on the other two. I'm sorry, Dan. <laughs> one of them was yours. Um, one of them was that. <laughs> we said, had one of the ones that didn't work there. Well. They said, and start treating. And when I went to the Congo, I got to see people that even before FDA approval are being treated still in the extension of this clinical yeah, trial and being cured of Ebola now, walking out where they would have had a death sentence before. So that's, what, that's what we would try so to do. So for us, that's an end of the summer type of an yeah, event. That's what we would try to do. He just got back from the Congo, and uh, that's you know, dedication. He was, that was not an easy trip, was yeah. it? I mean, it wasn't easy to do that important. trial there, by the way. Kudos 
to Heroes. Tony. Heroes. Well, I want to thank everybody in this room. Mike, go ahead. Yeah, just I, I was about to do the same as President. Just pledge that our our whole task force, this whole team, HHS, I know CDC, President and I will be at NIH tomorrow. Look forward to working with all of you, and I want to I want to commend each and every one of you for responding to the President's call for action. This is all hands on deck and the news out of this meeting that you've already formed a consortium. We know we have the greatest pharmaceutical industry in the world in the United States, Mr. President, and now we know they will be working together to create therapeutics and ultimately a new vaccine to deal That's with fantastic. the coronavirus, and I want to thank you all. And anybody delays you, please call me. <laughs> and if they don't, just call Tony and Bob. Huh? Thanks. All right. Call Alex. 1,300 points today. 1,300? Yeah, 1,293, 5%. They must have heard about this meeting. I'm just curious. <laughs> who's, who's talking outside? I'm just curious for no, this is a very reality. optimistic meeting. Look, I know optimism and not optimism and pest the worst pessimism. And I will tell you, uh, the whole thing with therapeutics to me is very exciting. And obviously vaccine. but. Therapeutics is very exciting, especially when you're so far advanced. That's great. That's really great. Thank you. Thank you very much. Say hello to everybody. Thank you, everybody. They heard what happened in this meeting.